If you have $700 to spend on a new gaming PC and you need some help or maybe just some ideas, then this video is obviously the place to be. Let's get into it. Hey, welcome to Zach's Tech Turf. Just like you saw from the title today, I'm gonna to be showing you what's all inside my latest $700 gaming PC build guide. We're gonna benchmark it, and then most importantly, I'm gonna show you how to upgrade it in the future. And if you're new here and you wanna see other gaming PC build guide videos just like this one, then hit that subscribe button down below and also that notification bell. That way you never miss an episode. But yeah, let's check this build out. Today's video is brought to you by ASRock and specifically their new Z490 Extreme 4 motherboard. The Extreme 4 is not just the model ASRock sent me, but it's the one that I hand selected selected because I've purchased and used Extreme 4 motherboards in the past and I certainly trust them. This new Z490 model packs a punch supporting not only Intel's newest 10th gen processors but can even overclock the non-K versions with its base frequency boost technology. The Extreme 4 also contains a blazing fast PCIe 4.0 M.2 socket, DDR4 RAM up to 4266MHz, a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, two PCIe 3.0 X10 slots for AMD's Crossfire X, Polychrome Sync RGB, and even a heat dissipating PCB technology. Links to the ASRock Z490 Extreme 4 and all their other baller products are linked down in the description. Before jumping straight into the parts list, I do want to let you guys know for those of you that didn't attend, I actually built this PC on one of my Twitch live streams and I've literally been doing that for all of my build guides lately. You can find me over on twitch.tv slash zaxtechturf every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I would love to see you over there. All right, so starting with the CPU, the one that I have here is the Ryzen 3 3200G, but I do need to warn you about this one. This 3200G is certainly certainly a fantastic option if you can't afford the GPU, which we'll talk about later, but if you are going to buy the GPU now, then I would definitely recommend instead picking up a Ryzen 5 1600 IF. As a disclaimer, most of these parts in this build guide today were just parts that I had laying around the studio, and honestly, I really just wanted to get the 3200G in a build guide so I could sell it because I don't need it anymore. The 1600 IF is 100% a better option if you can afford the GPU as it's rocking the Zen Plus architecture and it's essentially almost a 2600, but do go Go with the 3200G if you can't afford the GPU right now. Speaking of which, the GPU that I decide to go with is an EVGA GTX 1660 Ti Black Edition, and I do have a dedicated video on this one if you want some dedicated benchmarks. The 1660 Super probably provides a little bit more bang for your buck, but absolutely nothing wrong with going with a Ti version. Next up, we have the motherboard, and this here is an ASRock B450M HDB. This is one of the cheapest B450 motherboards that you can buy right now. It's only rocking two RAM slots and not great VRMs for overclocking, but if you're looking to just hop into the AMD for a platform on the cheap, then this one will be perfectly fine. Do be aware that there's actually an R4.0 version of this motherboard. It's just a little bit updated, so go with that one if that's what you see for sale. Moving on, we get to the RAM, and this is the only part that I actually had to buy for this system today. Remember, these are all just spare parts that I had laying down here in my studio. I can't emphasize that enough, but I decided to go with the Olo 16 gigabyte kit clocked at 3000 megahertz. I've actually never used YOLO RAM before. I don't even know how to properly pronounce it, but I always see these kits go on sale, so I wanted to try it out for myself. Moving on, we get to storage, and once again, in yet another build, the Corsair MP510 M.2 480GB SSD makes another appearance. You guys know by now that I use this SSD all the time and it's super fast and reliable, and I always dig the simple black sticker on the front of it for a clean design. Speaking of clean designs, this case here is the Deep Cool Cube 310. They actually sent this to me a long time ago and I finally found a reason to use it. And overall, this is about as clean as it gets and I'm really digging the overall aesthetic of it. Obviously, you can see from these tiny vents that this isn't gonna be great in terms of airflow, but other than that, I'm really digging the bottom hinge side panel. Literally everything in the case is all black, so it's a nice and clean design. And it even came with the GPU support bracket installed, but we didn't need that with our 1660 Ti. And for our last main component of the build, this is the part that I'm the least happy with as it's the 500 watt white certified EVGA unit. Yes, this is rocking super ugly ketchup and mustard cables. This is usually a big no-no on my channel, and I'm sorry you have to look at them today. But once again, I was just looking to get rid of some of these parts down here in my studio, so I selected this one. If you're looking to replicate this build, you would actually save money by swapping out the 3200G for the 1600 AF, and then I would use that extra money to buy a power supply with all black cables. Please do that. Other than that though, the only non-performance extra part that I installed were these up here RGB fans that I bought for $30. Just like always, I'm not gonna include these in the parts list because they have absolutely no effect on performance, but it's 2020 and we gotta include some RGB in the thumbnail. I actually really like this RGB kit, by the way, though. For $30, you're getting five fans, a hub, and the remote control, and it's just super easy to turn a non-RGB build into an RGB one for this price point, so you'll probably see this same kit in the future videos as well. With that out of the way, though, here's what everything is looking like, and as you can 
can see, we're sitting right around $700. Just to reiterate, I do recommend swapping out some things to make this a proper updated build guide. You'll want the 1600 AF over the 3200G, the HDV R4.0 over the normal HDV, and then I would personally recommend buying something like the EVGA 500 watt N1 power supply because that one's rocking all black cables. So with our somewhat sketchy parts list out of the way, it's now time for some benchmarks. The only part that's actually gonna make a difference in terms of performance is if you go with that 1600 AF and you're actually gonna get better results than what I'm about to show, but let's just benchmark what we have anyway. So obviously the first game up is Fortnite. Can I get a like down below for actually recording enough to get a kill for you guys? But yeah, with this system, I used our normal settings of 1080p and low with far view distance and I average 153 frames per second. As you can see, the lows are really low because of that Ryzen 3, so make sure you lock that FPS to your monitor's refresh rate and that'll climb up. Next up was Counter-Strike and in 1080p and low settings, I got a solid average of 183 frames per second. But once again, that Ryzen 3 is causing some pretty inconsistent 1% and 0.1% lows. Following that was Rainbow Six Siege. Although you're seeing some actual gameplay, I did indeed benchmark with the built-in benchmarking tool like I always do. And in 1080p, I could actually crank the settings up to very high and still average 173 frames per second. Getting into our tougher to run games, I fired up Borderlands 3. This is one of the many games that I have a dedicated benchmark marking video on by the way, and in 1080p and medium settings we got a solid 76 FPS. After that was Gears 5, slightly easier to run this one compared to Borderlands, and in 1080p and high settings we got just over our target 60 FPS mark. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds followed up after that. Now here I'm very happy to showcase that I finally got a kill while benchmarking this game. It's probably been like a year since that happened, and in 1080p and medium settings I got 84 FPS. Call of Duty Modern Warfare was up next, and I decided to benchmark during normal multiplayer because we get way more consistent results compared to the big open map of Warzone, and in 1080p and medium settings, I got a pretty high FPS average of 96. Probably should have upped the settings a bit more for this one. And finally, for our eighth game in this benchmarking run, I decided to bring back Forza Horizon 4. It's not the best game for benchmarking because we can't use MSI Afterburner and we only get the average FPS from the built-in benchmarking tool, but I included it because we've been absolutely killing Forza on the Twitch live streams lately, and we've been having a ton of fun. Make sure you follow me again over there on twitch.tv slash I stream every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, but yeah, back to the benchmarking results here in 1080p and high settings with dynamic resolution turned off, I got a solid 98 FPS. Well, that's gonna wrap up my $700 gaming PC build guide, the benchmarks for it, and how I would upgrade it in the future. As always, drop a comment down below about what you thought of the system or what you would personally do to upgrade it. And after that, feel free to head on over to one of these two videos if you haven't seen them yet. Definitely hit that subscribe button and make sure you follow me over on Twitch because we got some more PC build guides coming.